بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم الغني وأنتم الفقراء والله الغني وأنتم الفقراء والله الغني وأنتم الفقراء تتولوا يستبد قوما غيركم ثم لا يكونوا ثم لا يكونوا أمثالكم. So the topic I was giving to given to discuss today was uh, reinventing your marriage. And so I don't want to cause too much drama in the households, right? So we're not going to reinvent per se, but uh, I'm going to give you some pointers, inshallah, that maybe you can use and you can implement and it'll make your marriage uh, much better. And if you're not married, take these things into account because it's better to know about things before they happen than when you're stuck and then you're looking for uh, advice and an answer. So there's gonna be some very good advice. Inshallah, the way the lecture or, to or this topic is gonna be broken down is I'm gonna mention a couple of scenarios to start. Uh, hopefully there'll be some interaction with the audience. Secondly, we're going to discuss some modern day science as to how to go about being married and having a healthy relationship. And then third, we're going to return to those scenarios in light of the science and, and sort of reinterpret those scenarios with the science and see how we come out, okay? So, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. The first thing the first scenario that we're going to start with is I want you to imagine that you're a newlywed, right? You've just been married a couple of months and it's Eid. And so you don't know if you like the girl yet for the guys and the girls too if you don't know if you like the guy yet. But the, the guys, for the guys you decide that you're going to buy your wife a bracelet. And it's like a rubber band bracelet. You don't want to spend too much money. You spend so much money on the wedding on the maha, right? So you get her a cheap $20 bracelet, but she loves it. It has so much sentimental value for her, right? It might be her favorite color or something. You lucked out. And then the next day of Eid, you decide you're going to go out with the entire family on a camping trip to the Poconos. And while you're in the camp, in the cabin with your family, I want you to imagine your entire family being there, not just you and your wife, but everybody, your in-laws, uncles, aunts, cousins, everybody, whole family, kids running around, cousins, everybody. And then you decide, you know, you want to get away from the madness, and so you're going to take a hike up the mountain. But as you're walking out of the cabin, everyone sees you, and they want to know where you're going, and so they start to follow. So you're walking up this, up this mountain, whole family in tail. It's after Asr, you wanted to just get away, but everyone's following you now. And all of a sudden your phone dies GPS is dead you've walked too far you have no idea where you are it's getting dark sun is going down you hear some wolves not too far away a couple of the little kids are crying how would you feel in this moment right a little scared a little uneasy and now imagine at this very moment that your wife comes up to you and she says to you Honey, you know that $20 bracelet that you got me yesterday? Uh, I seem to have misplaced it. I don't know where it is. How would you react? How would you react? Very scared. How would you react? Any one of you. Not the kids, you're not married. <laughs> An adult. How would you react? Initial reaction would be upset. You know, like, I mean, here it is, we're... we're surrounded by wolves and you're looking for a Yeah, and you're right? Exactly. You'd be a how would you react? I would kill her. You would kill her. You would kill her. The gentleman in the front said he would kill her. Right? So throw it to the wolves, he said. Throw it to the wolves. Okay. Oh man, this is gonna be a good lecture for you guys. So so we have have a guy who would be upset and a guy who would kill her and throw her to the wolves. Okay, mashallah. 
So what's interesting is those aren't too far off answers. But what's even nicer is that there's an example of this scenario in the seerah of the Prophet As was the habit for the Prophet he would always take one of his wives with him whenever he went on an expedition. And so he was on an expedition with his companions and he just happened to have Aisha radiallahu anha with him. And so they're in a valley, the valley of Bayda at this moment. And all of a sudden, this valley, enemy territory, it's getting dark. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she just informs him that she lost her necklace, a very sentimental necklace to her. No other reason than just to inform the Prophet. And what does the Prophet ﷺ do at this moment? He stops the entire caravan and he has every single person in the caravan look for that necklace. SubhanAllah. So now compare our reactions in the first scenario with how the Prophet ﷺ reacted in this scenario. And remember this because we'll return to it inshallah in the, towards the end. In the second scenario, imagine that here at, what is it, I-E-C-P-A, that's so many letters. Uh, imagine that you guys are having a barbecue, right? And the barbecue is taking place here outside in the parking lot, if there's a parking lot. And it's pretty, it's like this, this amount of space, so you can kind of uh, see everybody here, everything that's going on. And you walk out that day and you switch phones with your wife by accident. And so as you're looking through your phone, as she's looking through her phone, she notices she has your phone and you notice you have her phone. And then all of a sudden, she has your phone, she knows she has your phone, and you get a phone call. And you get a phone call from a female coworker. Her name is Yasmin. Except your wife, she doesn't know that this is a female coworker. And she just sees a random Yasmin calling you. And now imagine if she took that phone and in front of everyone just slammed the phone to the ground. Just like spiked it. Like it was a football. How would you react? How would you react? <laughs> How would you react, sir? The, the wife spiked your phone. That's a plus. That's a, that's a plus. How would you react? iPhone. Uh, you throw her to the wolves. So he'd take her camping and throw her to the wolves. How would you react? Huh? You would what? Kill her. Over a phone. Yes, how do you? Get a new phone. Okay, see the young kids here, they said no problems, no worries, we'll just get a new phone. MashaAllah, very prophetic of you. So, we have, again, we have an example in the seerah of the Prophet where one day, uh, and Anas عنه, he narrates the story, where one day the Prophet was in the house of one of his wives. And another one of his wives had sent over some food to the house of the wife that he was in. And when the wife in whose house the Prophet was in saw this plate of food coming from another wife from outside, she smacked the plate of food and the plate fell to the ground and broke all over the ground. Right? Food everywhere, pieces of glass everywhere. And how did the Prophet react? The Prophet he said two words, Gharat Ummukum, and he proceeded to clean the entire area himself. Right? So now imagine how you would have reacted, throwing her to the wolves again, even though there are no wolves this time. <laughs> and uh, how the Prophet ﷺ diffused the situation in, in the seerah. And then lastly, just a last example, a last scenario I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that right now this conference ends, you get in the car with your wife and you drive about two blocks. As you get two blocks away from the masjid, you get a flat tire. Right when you get the flat tire, you're only two blocks away from the masjid, plenty of Muslims can come and help you. Your wife just starts to cry uncontrollably. And you look at her, and you're just like, what's, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And she just cries, and cry, like she's not even responding to you, she's just crying. And the more that you ask her what's going on, the more she is crying. How would you react in that situation? Let her cry, go fix the tire. Let her cry and go fix the tire, okay, that's, that's nice of you. 
pragmatic. How would you react? <laughs> got some violent men here. They're just gonna kill their wives. Send her to her parents. Send her to her parents. Talk to, talk to her and calm her down. Okay, so the, again, we have an example of this in the seerah of the Prophet where Safiya radiallahu anha, she narrates that they were going to Hajj, right? And they were in the middle of the desert, and as they were walking, she was on a camel, and that camel had stopped walking, it, it just broke down. And so when this happened, Safiya radiallahu anha, she narrates that she started to cry, and she kept crying. And so the Prophet sallallahu stopped everyone and he walked over to her and he asked her why she was crying. And she says that the more that he asked her, the more she kept crying. And so he simply began to wipe the tears away from her face. So subhanAllah, look at how we might have reacted in our scenario versus how the Prophet sallallahu reacted in this scenario. And again, we're going to get back to these stories, scenarios and stories from the seerah and towards the end. Um, but now let's look at what modern day science says and how we can compare that with how our Prophet ﷺ acted. So modern day science, there is a psychologist by the name of Dr. Jonathan Gottman. And this man has been studying relationships for the last 50 years, that's his job. He sits and watches videos of couples on a daily basis. And he's gotten so good at watching these videos, they say that if he watches a 15 minute video of a couple talking about anything, he can predict with about 90% accuracy whether that, whether that couple is gonna be married in 10 years or not. And they say that if he watches a full hour, the percentage increases to 95%. That's how good he is. And what he does, he films these 15 minute portions of these videos and then he watches them in slow motion and he breaks every second down and he looks every second, he compares it to the facial image of the man and of the woman. And so at the end of the 15 minutes, he has 900 data points for the man, right, 900 seconds, and 900 data points for the woman. 900 seconds and he attributes in every single second a number a number to the facial expression that the man and the woman exhibit so they in second number one the man might look angry so he'll put a, a number one in second number two he might exhibit disgust and so he'll give him a number five and so on and so forth and he's created an algorithm where he can take all these numbers and then insert it into a formula and predict uh, with almost 90% accuracy whether this couple will get uh, divorced or not within 10 years. But even without the numbers, he says that he can sit and hear just a three minute conversation and if he hears four different things, different characteristics within that conversation, he can still predict with pretty high accuracy if that family, if that couple will get divorced or not. And the four things he looks for, he calls them the four horsemen of divorce. And so pay attention to these because these are what might save your marriage, right? If you can understand these concepts, you can understand how to, how to fix them if they exist or how to avoid them if they don't exist, right? And so the first horseman that he, he, he says, is criticism. So what is criticism? Criticism is basically implying that there's something wrong with that person that you're criticizing. And so let's take an example. Your wife asks you to take out the trash. You forget to take out the trash, right? Not lazy, you forget. So the next day, your wife again, she asks you to take out the trash. You forget again. The house stinks by now, right? Because she hasn't taken it out. The third day, again, she comes up to you and now she's like, listen, you never listen to me. You're the worst listener ever. Why won't you just take out the trash when I ask you? That's a criticism. She attacks you and attacks your person 
and says that there's something wrong with you, right? You never listen to me, that's something wrong with you. What Dr. Gottman says is criticism is different from complaining. And complaining is okay because if you complain about a situation, you're not attacking the person necessarily. So an example for how to go about saying that in a better way, how to complain in a better way, would might be to say, um, instead of you're the worst listener ever, you would say, you know, the house stinks. Can you please take out the trash? It's been two days. Now you've just complained about the situation. You didn't attack the person and it may or may not get done. Inshallah gets done though, right? So that's the first horseman, criticizing. And usually Dr. Gottman says this is found in women more than in men. I'm sorry, women. But there are some, some horsemen that are found more in men, don't worry. The second horseman that he, he puts forward is called defensiveness, right? So again, let's take the same example. Defensiveness means you're defending yourself from a criticism, right? You're not owning up to the wrong that's in you or in the situation and you're just defending yourself. So for example, your wife asks you to take out the trash, you don't take it out, the house stinks. The next day, your wife says, you know what, the, ha the, the trash is just too heavy for me. I need a man with your muscles to take it out, right? Now she's not even criticizing you, she's complimenting you to try and take out the trash. And instead of doing the thing where she's asking you to do, you, say, you get defensive. And you say, I work all day, and I worked 12 hours today and why won't you just take out the trash, right? You got defensive instead of accepting the complaint and moving forward with it and remedying the situation, right? So those are the first two, criticizing and defensiveness. These two things, if they're seen a lot in a relationship, it's bad news for that relationship. The third thing is stonewalling. And stonewalling is basically where you don't care anymore. You just ignore the other person. Right? You don't have time for this. Right? So your wife complains about you taking out the trash, you don't take it out. The next day you come home from work, she's like, I thought I told you three times, four times to take out the trash. And you walk into the room and you get on your computer, you go on Facebook and you just completely ignore it. That's stonewalling. That's where you don't care anymore. And he says, Dr. Gottman says, when you see this, especially this is seen more so in men where they stonewall, they just uh, sort of check out. When you see this, this is a very big sign that the relationship is at a breaking point. And the way to address this would be to stop and actually ad address the situation at hand. Instead of ignoring it and letting it linger, try to address it in that moment. And then the last of the four horsemen, again, criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and then the last and the worst of all the four horsemen is something called contempt. And contempt is where you put yourself at a higher level than the other person, right? It's sort of like arrogance, like Iblis, right? You're just talking down to that person. And a lot of times this comes as insults, as curses, like right? where you might, I'm not going to curse, but you might insult that person to the extent where they can't even take it. And I've, I've had this where a friend of mine who got divorced, he actually told me where we would fight with one another and I would, I would stone, she would criticize me. I got to the point where I was stonewalling her. I was just ignoring the situation. I was getting away. And she even said to me where, if you were a man, you would hit me instead of, instead of ignoring the situation. So she even went as far as showing contempt for his manhood, right? And this happens. This is, this is a common thing in relationships and especially in our society. So don't think that it doesn't happen. And at this point, Dr. Gottman says there's, it's very hard to find the remedy. When it gets to this point, usually that relationship will end up dissolving when there's contempt shown between the two, between the two parties. And so, at the end of the day, no one is saying that these things aren't going to exist. Again, every relationship is going to have its ups and downs. But now that you know that these are things that you should look for that could lead to your marriage going south, you can address them in the proper way. And then, those are the four don'ts. Those are the four, four things that Dr. Gottman says you shouldn't do. He says though that in the videos where he watches a successful couple, a relationship that he knows is gonna last, the one thing, and he picks out one characteristic that's common between every single video that he watches, 
with a successful couple. And the one thing he says that's common to all those videos is kindness. He says that the way that the husband and wife interact with one another, all their conversation has an inherent kindness to it, right? Their interaction, the way they touch, the way they look at each other, the way they speak to one another has inherent kindness in it. And so, real quick, just to speak about kindness, imagine kindness as a continuum because kindness is different for men and women. Women view kindness as love and affection, more so than men do, right? A woman, and I've seen this before, you, a man could be beating a woman in the street and someone will come and defend her and she will beat up the guy who's trying to defend her, right? She'll say, my husband love me, leave him alone. Or if the cops come to, to arrest him, she'll be like, no, no, he didn't do anything to me. He loves me, right? How many times does that happen? Women suffer from domestic abuse so much because they can't get out of that relationship because they think, oh, he loves me. Oh, he, he really does love me, even though he's abusive and he's showing me a lack of respect, right? So women are usually oblivious to a lack of respect and very hypersensitive to a lack of love, right? If that same man completely ignored her instead of hitting her, that's when you see infidelity and the marriage that that's it, it's not gonna work, right? Because he's ignoring me, he's not showing me any love, he doesn't love me. Whereas if he beat her, she, would still, she still might think that he loves me. And men are the opposite. They're on the opposite continuum of kindness. Whereas men, they view kindness as showing respect, right? So a man, forget hitting him, if you speak to him in a bad way, if a wife spoke to her husband in a bad way, especially in front of people, he would view that as being very unkind, a lack of respect. Whereas if the wife just ignored him, what would he do? He'd be chilling, he'd be, I'm gonna go on Facebook, go on ESPN, why? He might not even notice that there's a problem going on because he doesn't view a lack of love as a lack of kindness, right? He's oblivious to that. So men are oblivious to a lack of love and very hypersensitive to a lack of respect. And so the one thing, like I said, that Dr. Gottman sees as, a, as an inherent quality in successful relationships is kindness. And he has an entire book and seven points to a happy marriage, very big book, very long seven points, I'm not gonna mention them here, but even to read those seven points, it took a lot of patience. And to try to implement those seven points in your marriage would take a lot of patience. And kindness and patience, I believe, are on the flip side of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. It's very easy to get angry at the moment, right? And very hard and shows an extreme amount of patience that it would take for you to be kind in a moment where your natural inclination is to get upset, is to get angry. And so, what did the Prophet Sallallahu say with regards to all of this? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says, treat women kindly, for indeed they were created from a rib, and the most crooked part of the rib is the highest part. So if you try to straighten the rib, you might break it, and if you leave the rib as it is, it'll remain crooked. Therefore, treat women kindly. And so there's many different interpretations as to, hadith, as to this hadith and how we want to take it and understand it. But there's a couple of things that are very clear. One statement is the Prophet Sallallahu saying that the woman is like the rib, right? And so if you try to straighten that rib, you're going to break it. And what does Dr. Gottman say? If you try to straighten your relationship with things like criticism, defensiveness, and contempt, what's going to happen? You're going to break your relationship, right? And secondly, the Prophet ﷺ says, if you leave that rib crooked, it'll remain crooked, right? If you leave it alone, right? Stonewalling. So Dr. Gottman says it, if you approach the relationship in a way where you're just going to be out of it, just going to leave it alone, it's going to stay like that and it's going to, you're going to break that relationship. And so it's a lose-lose and you have to find a balance in between those two things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. And what does he tell us is the way to balance the, between those two things? He mentions it in the beginning of, of the hadith and at the end of the hadith. He says, treat women kindly, treat women kindly. He says it twice. So subhanAllah, 
What this scientist today is discovering is the key to a successful marriage in the 21st century. The Prophet وسلم, already mentioned it 1400 years ago. SubhanAllah. And so, let's go back to the scenarios that I mentioned in the beginning, right? The fr we'll take the last story first. The story of Safiya radiallahu anha while she was on the camel, right? And she continually cried and cried and cried. This story shows an immense amount of kindness from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How so? Because he he doesn't. They're in the desert. They're on camels. They're going to Hajj. He's not telling his wife, "Yalla halsini, let's go. We're in the middle of the desert. Why are you crying? Just get on another camel." No, he stops in the middle of the desert in the heat, and he walks up to her and he asks her to stop crying. Immense kindness. And then another thing that goes unnoticed is the fact that he wiped the tears away from her face. And they say that kindness is way more related through physical touch than through words. And there's studies today, recently, where they took a school. They did a study where they took a school. And they asked professors to ask the students to volunteer for a project. And so they asked one group of teachers to ask one group of students to volunteer and simply ask them. Then they asked another group of teachers to ask those same students, but in that same time when they were asking, they told them to touch the student, to either shake their hand, put your arm around them, have some physical form of contact when you ask. And they found that 75% more of the students who were either had their hand shaken with the professor or had, their, had the professor's arm around them were uh, more likely to volunteer than the ones who were simply asked with just words. So the Prophet here is showing us how kindness is not just with words but with actions. And in the entire seerah, if you read the seerah, you'll see where the Prophet numerous times with Aisha, he's sleeping on her lap, she's sleeping on his lap. They're showering together. They're eating from the same place, right? right? She would eat from the meat from a certain place and he would take that same part and eat from the same part. He would drink from the same part. Always staying physically, physically connected with his wives. And for the women, right, we discussed that kindness shown to men is more about respect, right? Look at how Khadija radiallahu anha, how she treated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa especially when, she, when they were first married together. Imagine, imagine that you get married and your husband is spending weeks upon weeks away from you. The Prophet ﷺ would spend weeks upon weeks in the cave of Hira, right? And Khadija radiallahu anha, she never tells him, how come you never spend time with me? How come you're leaving me? Why'd you do this, right? Always, uh, she had the patience and she showed him the kindness that he needed in order to become the individual that he became wasallam. And now let's look at the second story. The second story that I mentioned, the story of the plate, where the wife, radiallahu anha, she broke the plate in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This story shows an immense amount of patience. And like I said, kindness and patience are flip side of the same coin, right? We had, we had a brother say that he would throw her to the wolves because she, she, she broke his phone, right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam not only has the patience and the kindness to diffuse that situation. How does he diffuse it? He knows that there's people watching. And so he addresses the situation for what happens. He says, Gharat. She became jealous, right? But then what, he, what does he call her? He calls her Ummukum. Your mother became jealous. And he immediately establishes the respect in the eyes of everyone who is watching. Because who is the most respected person in Islam? The mother. So even though she became jealous, that doesn't mean that you're going to look down upon her because she's still your mother. Gharat Ummukum. Immense patience. And then he went and he cleaned the entire thing for himself, right? One of us would be like, what? are you crazy? Go get the broom and yalla, clean. No, the Prophet wasallam knew it was a tense situation and he showed the patience and the kindness in order to, to diffuse that situation. And then the last story that I mentioned, 
which was the first scenario, the last thing I'll mention here, was the story of Aisha radiallahu anha when she lost the necklace. So what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do? He, he stopped the entire caravan and he had every single person looking for the necklace. And so as the companions are looking for the necklace, what happened? They got scared that they would run out of water in enemy territory and they wouldn't have enough water to pray, right? That's what's on their mind. And so Abu Bakr, they go complaining to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr, he goes to Aisha and he finds the Prophet sallallahu asleep in her lap. And what does he do? He chastises her, but he doesn't go full force because he sees the Prophet sallallahu asleep there. He doesn't want to disrupt it. And then what happens in the next day? The next day, the verses of Tayammum are revealed. And the companions are so happy that they, one of the companions, he goes to Abu Bakr and he, say, he says, this is not the first blessing that has come from the house of Abu Bakr. Right? And so this shows that with patience and with kindness, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu sta'inu bis sabri wa salaa inna allaha ma'as sabri Indeed Allah is with those who are patient So as long as you're showing kindness and your default is to show kindness and to have patience the barakah of Allah will be put into that relationship Whereas if you go around with contempt with defensiveness with criticism that those are the signs that the relationship is not going to work and the last thing I'll mention now that my time is almost up, I want to be on time, right? Chef Shanawi talked about being on time. We don't want to take too much time. The last thing I'll mention is that we hear these stories of the companions, of the prophets, and we sort of think like this happened in another age, right? The Prophet was the best of men, right? How can we emulate that, right? But the idea is that he was still a man. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He made the prophets men so that we could emulate them. They weren't angels, they weren't something that we could not achieve. They were men in order to be examples for us. And so I always like to mention and finish off with a story from my personal life that's relevant to the topic that I'm talking about. And I had uh, an experience, not myself, but in my family, my mother got married to my father and she was a non-Muslim when she married my father. And so my dad accepted that fact. She told him, I'm never gonna be a Muslim. Are you okay with that? He says, I'm okay with that. Let's get married, right? He liked the way she looks. So, so he gets married and in our culture, usually that you'll live with your in-laws for a little bit of time when you first get married. So they were living with my dad's family. And my dad has five sisters. And they were in the house constantly, in my mother's ear, telling her that she had to become a Muslim. And after a week of hearing this, she got fed up. And she told my dad, you have to do something because I can't, I can't live like this. And so my dad, not knowing what to do, being a kind and patient gentleman, he goes to his father and he asks his father to say something to his sisters. And so my grandfather has a sit down with all the family and he tells his daughters listen do not say anything about islam to this woman she doesn't want to be a muslim she's not going to be a muslim leave her alone no doubt nothing leave her alone and when my mom saw this from my grandfather she immediately became attracted to that kindness that he had for her the fact that he would do that for her and my dad, alhamdulillah, his headache is over now. His wife is no longer complaining. He's fine and dandy, still kind, still patient. And within three months after that time, my mom just happened to become much closer to my grandfather. And my grandfather, in his own wisdom, would give her da'wah. And within three months, she became a Muslim. And then she started praying. And then my dad started praying after she started praying. <laughs> So subhanAllah, with kindness and with patience, always Allah is going to put barakah in that relationship. So if you don't remember anything, remember that, that final statement. Kindness and patience, Allah will put barakah in your relationship. <laughs> Make it a source of benefit in our marriages and the marriages of our children. Help us retain it. Remember, at the, ver at the very least, the last line of it, for your marriage, 
But for the prizes, you got to remember more than one line, though. So let's get to the questions first before some house, housekeeping. Ammar is here, right? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so we'll go a bit of change of format from last year to uh, ensure a bit more equity. After every lecture, there will be two questions. One question for the brothers, until one of them gets it right. Another question for the sisters, right? Uh, so, I don't want to uh, only focus on the negative, but for the sake of putting it behind us once and for all, he mentioned the four horsemen of a failed marriage. You remember them? So let's start with the brothers. What are two at least? Order is not important. We'll be actually in it. What are two out of the four horsemen of a failed marriage? Your name, Akhi? Perfez. Perfez. Nice to meet you, Perfez. Uh, criticism. Uh, Kindness will destroy your marriage. And what else? <laughs> <laughs> criticism. And I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Criti cri criticism and defensiveness. It's like a low khayyam. Can you come claim your prize? Or are you donating it? You're not allowed to donate it. Come get your prize. <laughs> Ah, look, the prizes, the monetary values in here, we upgraded from last year. One sister, may Allah bless her, say Ameen. She, she brought these very, very, very beautiful uh, booklets. They're basically the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a very beautiful, colorful, short explanation on each of them. I know Ammar is going to answer all the questions now because he's giving a course on the subject. Uh, but the speakers get a free book as well. Zakhallah khayra. Brother Fetz, Zakhallah khayra. Sisters, what are the two? MashaAllah. You guys are so ready to fail your marriages. <laughs> These are not assignments, right? These are danger zones. I think, forgive me, I think the first hand to go up was our sister in the aisle with the black hijab. The other two, not those that were mentioned. She took notes. Allahu Akbar. Contempt and stonewalling. Jazakallahu khairan.